thank you good afternoon everyone uh, next 15 minutes i will try to uh, speak about post transplant tma management i'll start with the case scenario it's a 33 year old lady married with two children in 2017 evaluated for nausea and vomiting found to have a kidney disease with hypertension not evaluated further 2018 presents to her, presented to her, our hospital with end stage kidney disease bilateral small kidney and started on dialysis 2019 she underwent kidney transplant with husband as donor cross match was negative atg induction with pre tac and mp as maintenance immunosuppression uneventful surgery post op day 4 she presented when I mean, she has a graft dysfunction in peripheral uh, investigation blood investigation was suggestive of tma tacrolimus was withheld she underwent kidney biopsy biopsy was suggestive of thrombotic microangiopathy c4d was negative dsa was a uh, negative she required 10 sessions of plasma pheresis and everolimus started later creatinine improved to 1.54 she was readmitted again with uh, graft dysfunction and features of tma biopsy is again suggestive of tma no evidence of rejection three more sessions of plasma pheresis started on dual immunosuppression continued on that currently doing well with creatinine of 0.87 she visited our hospital in last uh, this month so this is a case summary who has a nkd unknown post transplant tma probably triggered by drug and uh, no evidence of any infection or rejection genetic workup or antibodies are not done improved with plex and drug discontinuation doing well on low dose steroid and mpa so with which i will uh, be the next 15 minutes i will try to answer these questions uh, uh, throughout my talk so first question how do i define thrombotic microangiopathy post transplant is a rare and rare but severe complication often leads to graft loss if are not recognized promptly poor outcomes in recurrent tma even in de novo tma graft loss up to 35% the two principal mechanisms are endothelial injury and activation and excessive platelet aggregation and activation it's a histopathological uh, term the gold standard is a kidney biopsy systemic signs of tma may be absent so biopsy is essential but it doesn't give much information on underlying cause that's very important so as we know the alternate complement pathway is involved and the complement uh, regulators factor h factor i the circulating factors and the membrane bound uh, factors so the complement factor h is a important one which by competes with complement factor b to, uh, to bind to c3b it also acts as a cofactor for complement factor a mediated cleavage of c3b and thrombomodulin and membrane cofactor protein uh, or the membrane uh, bound complement regulators try to regulate the alternate complement pathway so uh, what do you see in tma there is a microvascular thrombi and fibrinoid necrosis and uh, fibrin can be uh, seen in the subendothelial space and lumina of glomerular capillaries, capillaries and mesangiolysis and there will be fragmented rbcs can be seen later stages it can lead to uh, concentric thickening of small arteries these are the various histological uh, features there can be fibrin thrombus Uh, um, obliteration of lumen of a small renal artery there can be endothelial swelling fragmented rbcs in later stages that can be a gbm reduplication and em you can see a fibri fibrin tactoids so it's often uh, there can be a mild or small ring tma which should not be missed there can be a, a mild to moderate subendothelial widening which can often get missed and there can be features to suggest chronic tma because of double counters in glomerular capillary membranes how common is it uh, there are various case reports and case series which says about 0.8 to 14% uh, there is a meta analysis which was published recently uh, which showed de novo tma occurred in 3.2% indian studies 9.1% uh, 1%, 1% and there is unpublished data from our center showed 0.7% this is a recent uh, a uh, study from france published which showed early tma that is within 2 weeks can occur in up to 1.5% so coming on to what are the common causes of post transplant tma so any of this common any of these causes which can cause tma in the native kidney can also occur in transplant patients so 
Only thing is, important thing is, there can be a common triggers like infections, reject, uh, drugs, there can be a ischemic reperfusion injury, antibody mediated rejection or prolonged cold ischemia. These are the common triggers to cause a post-transplant TMA. So these are the two, uh, can be classified into two types. It can be a recurrent TMA in a patient with in native kidney disease being a TMA or de novo TMA. De novo TMA is more common, 90 to 95 percentage of cases. Recurrent TMA is rare, 5 to 10 percent of those cases. So recurrent TMA is mostly secondary to complementary regulatory factor genes or it can be in complementary gene C3 or it can be associated with anti autoantibodies like anti-factor H antibodies and autoimmune diseases. De novo TMA, uh, the most common thing is uh, due to ischemia reperfusion injury and it can be due to drugs, rejection and infections. Infections, common infections are parvovirus, cytomegalovirus and hepatitis C virus. So important point to note this, even in those patients, around 30 percentage of patients, they can have genetic abnormalities in complement regulators. It occurs mainly in the first two weeks and 30 percent of cases can be renal limited. So these are the common uh, mutations seen uh, in a recurrent TMA. Uh, the most common is complement factor H. The what important point to note is that uh, circulatory complement regulators have a high risk of recurrence, like complement factor H up to 90 percent, complement factor I is up to 80 percent, whereas uh, membrane bound has a lesser risk of recurrence. So that's very important so that we can prognosticate the patient and treat accordingly. So this is an important factor because the recurrence is rare in membrane bound because the endothelial cells within the graft express normal membrane uh, cofactor protein. So it, the res risk of recurrence is less. So but it it's often a uh, post-transplant TMA is often an interplay between donor and recipient genetic backgrounds as well as the environmental factors that can trigger the endothelial injury. So coming to CNA induced TMA, why it happens? Because there is an imbalance between the vasodilators and vasoconstrictors lead to glomer glomerular capillary arterial vasoconstriction and endothelial damage. In mTOR inhibitors, it's P70S6K signaling is blocked. So there is a prevention of endothelial cell pro proliferation. There is also a local activation of clotting cascade and consumption of platelets and red blood cell destruction in mTOR inhibitors. So very important to differentiate between CNA and TMA and ABMR because that management is different. There are clues which can help. There can be a proximal tubular vacuolization which helps, says it may be a CNA toxicity. There can be a peripheral nodular hyaline deposits and there can be a focal distribution pattern. Whereas in ABMR, uh, points to suggest are C4D staining of peritubular capillaries, circulating DSAs and there can be a end arteritis and intimal arteritis. Next question, how to evaluate for post-transplant TMA? As already discussed, there are histological features which we discussed in detail about uh, which suggest TMA. There can be biochemical parameters to suggest a TMA, which we all know. So whenever we come across a case with post-transplant TMA, we always look for the triggers which we discussed uh, earlier and always try to uh, treat that first. If all of them are negative, always consider investigations of complement system. So these are the various factors which can be uh, done. Mostly it's done by uh, MLPA uh, method or exome sequencing. So this is a study from India which is not published. It was presented in WC23 study from Nadiad which showed that uh, they have done uh, analysis of all patients who underwent transplant. Uh, it was the comp CFHR gene duplication was seen in 72 uh, of those patients, of 138 patients, followed by mutations of complement factor H in 6, I in 2 and M MCP in 2 and DGKE in 1. However, incidence of post-transplant TMA was 11 out of 138 patients, that is 7.9%. And uh, mutations related to a atypical H was seen in 9 out of those 11 patients. Uh, it was only a poster presentation, uh, paper is not published. They have said that there is no decrease in difference in GFR between those two groups. So coming on to how to manage post-transplant TMA. Uh, when we have proven TMA, always treat the offending agent. That's the first thing to do. Uh, decrease the ischemia times 
and uh, try to, uh, if you feel the CNA is offending agent, try to withdraw it, treatment of or decrease the dose. Any infections which should have triggered, try to treat the infection and if it's suggestive of ABM or treat that. If there is a resolution, it can be closely followed up. If we don't have, if there is a persistent TMA, then uh, we have to do a directed treatment like plasma exchange or eclusimab. So coming on to eclusimab uh, uh, for atypical HUS post kidney transplantation. So first important thing is prevention is important for a recurrent TMA. Whenever a patient presents with TMA as a native kidney disease, with, in, at end stage kidney disease, if it is not due to cigar toxin producing E. coli, always look for genetic mutations and which, because it can help us to confirm the diagnosis and also reinforce the need for prophylactic complement inhibition therapy after transplantation. If genetic is uh, not feasible, if the presentation is like a complement mediated TMA and family history is there, then you can always use a complement inhibition therapy without genetic mutation. Why eclizumab is important? The overall prognosis is poor in the pre eclizumab era. Recurrence is common and 90, up to 90% graft loss in first year. Eclizumab is a monoclonal antibody for complement, fact, uh, complement C5 and uh, blocks the generation of C5A and C5B9. Approved for treatment in, two, uh, uh, in 2011, results are encouraging mainly in uh, plasma refractory therapy or useful in plasma dependent therapy and can be used prophylactically to prevent post-transplant recurrence. So I will summarize a few studies, mostly case series. They are, they are from 2009 to 12 initially used for primary prophylaxis to prevent the development of HUS recurrence. Then they also used a secondary prophylaxis once the patient has been, uh, previous episode has been controlled with plasma therapy and also as a curative therapy in patients who had not shown response to plasma therapy. There was a good outcome. This is one of the paper published in 2013 which contained two trials, 17 and 20 patients. They felt it's starting early uh, and cautious withdrawal helps in decreasing the uh, relapse of HUS. This is one of the recent papers published in uh, 2023 in KA reports, uh, which they have, this is one of the largest case series published, 45 kidney transplant patients, uh, 35 out of them had a features of such as TMA. They have given a median duration of eclosima for six weeks uh, uh, and they had shown that renal recovery at six months was come good and there was no serious side effects noted. Among those patients, four patients had a uh, pathogenic or VUS found and uh, kidney outcome in those patients showed a complete remission. These are the parameters that follow. After starting treatment, they had shown good improvement. Even at last follow-up, ESRD was seen in 9% of patients, partial response or complete response in seen in rest of them. So this is what guidelines uh, suggest, always classify them as high risk, moderate risk and low risk. This is very important. High risk, if they have a previous early recurrence, pathogenic mutation is then or gain of function mutation is present, suggest a prophylactic eclosimab. If moderate risk, no mutation was found or it's isolated complement factor A mutations, uh, or persistently low anti factor H antibody, then either it can be prophylactic eclizumab or plasma exchange. If there's a low risk, less than 10%, isolated MCP mutations or persistently negative factor H antibodies, there's no need for prophylaxis. How long to continue? If there is a pathogenic mutation, they ideally it suggests to continue lifelong. If it's isolated MCP mutations or uh, uh, anti factor H antibody negative, discontinue treatment after 12 to 24 months. Dose is 900 mg, to, uh, given 24 hours prior to transplant, repeated 7, 14 and 21 days, followed by 1200 mg every 2 weeks. Disease donor give on post-op day 3 and weekly for 3 additional doses and 1200 mg every 2 weeks after that. Prophylaxis against meningococcal infection is uh, important. Treff levels can be monitored, although it's not done here, just for a theoretical uh, aspect, 50 to 100 should be maintained. So, in our patients where eclizumab is not widely available or it's not able to afford, what are the options? So, uh, there are studies which have looked at combined liver, liver kidney transplant before, thinking of correcting complement abnormality and prevent recurrence due to genetic abnormalities of liver, and liver origin. Uh, tran liver transplant can help, but 
there's a high mortality and morbidity hep with hepatic necrosis and vascular complications, so hardly used now. So what can we do? We can always try to treat a offending agent and monitor and plasma exchange can be tried. So either CNA inhibitor can be reduced or switching to another CNA inhibitor or it can be switched to mTOR inhibitors but also has a equal chance of having a developing a TMA. There are studies which looked at curative plasma therapy. If none of this works, whether eclizumab can be tried. So what is the uh, uh, rationale behind it? It removes vasoconstricted molecules and provides vasodilator uh, factors and normally functioning complement components. Uh, immunosuppressions like rituximab or cyclophosphamide can be added if anti factor H antibody associated. These are the published studies which shown that in recurrent uh, preemptive plasma therapy can be helpful. Duration is, they have few of them are given daily for one week and continued for variable months that shown there is a good response. What is the problem? It can, main, it may fail to prevent atypical HUS in some cases. There is unpredictable risk of recurrence. Evidence of subclinical atypical HUS can be had and what, what prolonged adequate vascular access and plasma allergy is a worry. So this is another study which looked at plasma exchange in de novo TMA. There are variable uh, reports saying that few of them are benefit, few of them required eclizumab as a rescue therapy. So this is one interesting study which I came across uh, which they say that without using eclizumab what can we do? They have used this strategy, they use basilizumab induction, triple dose therapy containing low dose tacrolimus, high uh, and strict blood pressure control, early use of stat statins and ACE inhibitors and extended CME prophylaxis and lifelong co-trimoxyl prophylaxis. So they did in uh, 17 patients, only one patient had a, a recurrent a TMA, even that patient recurred the eclizumab. So they suggest it can be tried as an alternative strategy when eclizumab is not available uh, or not affordable. So this is outcome from our, uh, one of the Indian study published in Indian Journal of Nephrology. Uh, two patients, uh, they had people who had a atypical, most of the common causes are drugs and rejection. People had a atypical uh, HUS had a recurrence and graft loss noted in our population. So what is the KDO guidelines recommend? They said if it is a sugar toxin a producing organism causing a atypical HUS, we should, not, we should not exclude from transplantation and uh, always look for genetic component. Uh, genetic or occurred defect has to be evaluated for and uh, the risk of reference should be considered and they suggest to give a complement inhibitor or combined liver kidney transplant. This summarizes the how do you manage a post-transplant TMA, identify the trigger, treat it. If there is eclizumab available, we can give. If not available, like in our country, we can always uh, try for plasma exchange and uh, other uh, protocols like what Netherlands study had followed. Any of the new medications being studied for atypical HUS? Yes, iptacopen. Uh, it's a factor B inhibitor. It has, it's been studied. Uh, this is a study protocol. Uh, it's also it is, they have included both native kidney transplant patients and native kidney patients and the transplant patients. Study is currently undergoing. It's a Apple HUS study. To take him, take home points. Uh, TMA is a rare but serious, severe complication. Two principal mechanism of TMA. Gold standard is biopsy, recurrent versus de novo TMAs. The clues to differentiate between CNA and TMA, uh, CNA induced TMA and TMA due to ABMR, use of eclizumab. If eclizumab is available, what to do? Either treat the triggers and plasma exchange. And the Netherlands study, which, held, which gave a strategy to manage without eclizumab. And finally, iptacopen, which is a factor B inhibitor, which is being studied. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the organizers for the, giving me the opportunity.